connected. Uh, I hope everybody had a productive uh, breakout session. Um, so thanks everybody for being with us today. Um, I believe that today is our largest turnout that we've had for an event since we started uh, the Pittsburgh cha chapter of EPI. And, you know, um, uh, Brian asked me to uh, do the intro today. He's, he's done it all the times before. So it gives me a good opportunity to say thanks to him. Uh, you know, he's really been the driving force to build this thing. And uh, I think the increased turnout and participation is, uh, is a testament to that. I also think that the increased turnout today uh, has a little bit to do with the topic uh, that, you know, Melissa is going to lead us through later. Uh, you know, ESOPs and, and, you know, just coincidentally, I think it's so timely. We've been talking here at Metz Lewis about becoming more focused in the ESOP area just because the way that the tax regime seems to be heading and just the whole um, uh, approach that the administration has to really focusing on middle class and workers, we feel that there's a good chance that ESOPs are going to maintain their tax favored status uh, and become a more viable alternative than they have been in the past um, as a form of exit. So uh, it's a great topic, it's a timely topic. Um, before we move on, just want to recognize our sponsors um, who are up here on the screen in front of us. Of course, Grossman, Yannick, and Ford. Uh, you're going to hear from Melissa. She's a partner there. Um, Interchange Partner, Interchange Capital Partners, that's Brian's uh, firm. Um, small Dot Big, any of you don't know Lori Barkman, um, you should tune into her podcast. It's really excellent. Uh, Metz Lewis, uh, that's our firm. Uh, Focus CFO, we're happy to have them as a sponsor. Uh, S&T Bank, uh, that's uh, uh, Frank's outfit. Um, we've all done a lot of deals with S&T. They're a great, great partner on the commercial lending side. And we have a new sponsor, um, Continuum Equity Partners. And I'll just take a minute because it's a, kind of an exciting thing for our Pittsburgh deal community. Our own Brian Dandria, who's on the... Um, you know, executive team here for the Pittsburgh chapter of EPI. Uh, he and uh, uh, George Palafis recently left uh, Pittsburgh Mez and formed Continuum, which is a Pittsburgh-based private equity firm. And it's something I think that uh, we really need. It's gonna be a big uh, addition to our, to our deal community here in Pittsburgh. So um, next slide, Rachel. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, just real quick, the rules of our chapter, uh, uh, no poaching. We want people to bring their clients and friends without feeling that they're, uh, you know, uh, that every other advisor is gonna be all over them. So no poaching, um, business owners, it's great to have advisors. Uh, you know, the great thing about exit planning is it's such a communal approach to advising. You know, um, it's not just the exit planner, it's the lawyer, it's the financial advisor, it's the accountant, um, but we all need business owners to advise. Um, so one of our rules is business owners attend anonymously um, and they won't be solicited by EPI, um, you know, after, after we get their information. And the third rule is really, um, uh, a, a suggestion more than a rule, get engaged. You know, um, again, Brian has done such a great job building something here. We've got a lot of momentum. And uh, like any organization, it's only as good as the people and the, and the uh, participation. So it's great to see everybody here. Keep coming. And if you have an idea uh, for content or some way to make it better what we do, if you want to get into sponsorship, uh, just give us a call. We'd love to have more of you. Okay, let's talk just real quickly about some an overview of the EPI approach to exit planning. Um, you know, I think that exit planning is a bit of a misleading phrase um, because when people hear exit planning, they tend to focus um, on the event of the exit, well, the, the exit event. But 
it's really the planning part uh, that's that's really the operative part of the phrase exit planning that we should focus on and that's what it's all about um, because it's um, you know you see here paradigm shift number one exit planning is business strategy the the planning part and the and there's a process to it and really what it does is it is a systematic approach to um, creating options for that exit so that when you get to the exit you're prepared um, you've got a bunch of great options because you've gone through a process of planning that has improved your company has made it stronger made it more viable and more more sustainable so um, uh, most business owners not all but most don't think that way you know they don't they, they they're running their business and then it's okay time to sell let me call someone and get this thing flipped here in the next six months and that's why we call it a paradigm shift because we think the better thing for owners is to change their their approach to that and start the planning for the exit well in ahead well in advance of the event. Um, Rachel, next slide. I'd handle my own slide turning, guys. I'm not a prima donna, but um, I, I have a lot of operator error when I'm involved with with technology. So. Um, so paradigm shift number two, and it's a direct follow on to number one is, you know, um, you can leave that one up, but paradigm shift number two is, it's all about transferability. That's, you know, uh, we've, we all on the advising side, have seen so many businesses over the years that it may be a good cash flow business, but it's really not transferable or it's certainly not transferable at the value that it should be if it were built out properly. Um, you know, the typical example we all we all use on the exit planning side is, you know, uh, you've got an owner who is such a force, but if that owner is the one that has all the key customer relations and or that owner is the ops guy who is the only one who knows how to kick the machine in the right place to get it running, um, that's a problem for a buyer, right? So uh, it is all about transferability. That, that's a, a paradigm shift that we uh, try to get owners to adopt. And the third paradigm shift in the EPI uh, exit planning process is really to, that, to get folks to understand that there's a methodology here. There's a process a, that's a proven process that if you just follow these steps, um, it will have success. And it's... Um, it, create, it, caught, it requires some discipline because like anything, there's some ups and downs. I think Chris Snyder, um, you know, the owner of EPI talks about how there's, uh, after the initial phase of the process, there's kind of some doubts that typically creep in for the owners because they don't see it moving in the, in the upward direction fast enough. But um, we, we try to focus on getting owners to accept this paradigm shift that there is a framework, and if you're disciplined and follow the framework, it will result in in, in getting you where you want to be. So that's the uh, uh, Rachel. Flip to the next slide, please. And we're not going to get into any detail on this, but this is the process. This is the exit planning, the EPI uh, value acceleration process. Um, you know, you see, there's three basic phases there: discover, prepare, and then decide what you're going to do, which is Kind of goes to my uh, point earlier about the decide parts at the end. That's where the options come in. Uh, you know, you, you might decide, hey, I, I always plan to get this thing ready to sell it. But now that I've got it where I need it and I've got the right team in place and I've taken all the risk out of the business, maybe I just want to collect checks for a while and let my team run it. That's hopefully where you get to the point where you've got a bunch of great options because you've, you've built a great company and hopefully this process helped you get there. Um, next, Rachel. Okay, so just a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items here. Mark your calendars, uh, Thursday, June 24th um, will be our uh, event on the tax landscape changing. How will business transactions be affected? That's gonna be a Zoom event on August 26th. Uh, managing change is the key to growth, um, which should be an interesting, uh, interesting session. And then out to October, October 28. Um, that one, if anyone has content thoughts or uh, um, uh, any other ideas about what we might do in that meeting, 
um, the suggestion box is open. So let us know your thoughts. Next, Rachel. Okay, so that takes us to our uh, highlight of the day, our, 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 our discussion. And um, it's gonna be, like I said earlier, about uh, ESOPs. And uh, we're gonna turn that over to Melissa. She's gonna introduce our guest and, and take us through some uh, learning in the ESOP area. Melissa. Thank you so much, Chris. <clears throat> and thank you so much for joining us this morning to talk about one of my favorite topics and that's employee stock ownership plans. Um, I have some panelists today that are going to help me uh, lead a discussion on um, just what are those catalysts that are moving or placing ESOPs at the forefront of exit planning. Um, you know, we kind of knew that things were changing obviously with the tax regime, but um, you know, for us that um, the advisors that really keep their, their fingers on the pulse of the uh, employee stock ownership community, um, we knew that things were brewing when uh, top Biden advisor, economic advisor, uh, Jared Bernstein had uh, joined the White House Council um, of Ec Economic Advisors. Um, Jared, uh, I think in 2016, uh, published a white paper that talked about ESOP saying, why aren't there more? So in the Biden administration, you know, what the goal is going to be is, um, and, and you know, with uh, Jared Bernstein, it's you know, trying, to, uh, trying to close in on that delta between the have and have nots, um, and that is uh, through employee ownership. Um, also uh, taking advantage of the many other uh, advantages and options that are provided through employee stock ownership plans. So, um, you know, with that brief introduction, I would love to introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, first, Brian Baum and um, Brian and I have been talking about ESOPs for uh, many years. Um, you guys know that Brian is not only the founder, he's the president of EPI. Um, Brian is also the managing partner at Interchange Capital Partners, you know, where he is uh, talking to his clients to build and execute uh, value acceleration and talking about uh, exit options. So, um, Brian, thank you again for assembling this panel. Um, and I'm ex very excited and, and proud to be uh, speaking with you and the two other panelists, uh, Dan Zugel. I think his title, his new title that I, I'd like to take credit for helping him work on, but Dan is the ESOP man. Um, Dan is the director and senior vice president of business transition advisors. I've worked with Dan uh, for well over a decade uh, working with uh, feasibility and ESOP transactions. Um, everything about ESOPs, Dan knows. Um, I call him with uh, questions constantly on uh, ESOPs. Uh, he is the guy uh, that frequently published author and featured speaker on ESOPs. Last but not least, uh, one of my favorite guys, Mark Nicholas. Uh, Mark is actually uh, the former owner of Nicholas Supply, uh, actually an ESOP that I know, uh, not only worked on the transaction uh, for his ESOP, which was in July of 2019. I'm fortunate enough to do the annual recurring valuation work for Mark's company, but Nicholas, uh, for over 55 years, Nicholas Supply has been in business as a plumbing supplier, proudly uh, providing uh, plumbing, kitchen, and bath products to Pittsburgh and surrounding areas. Um, there are two people that know me. There are two places that I love to visit most um, at my age. One would be any wine section of any store that has wine. And two is hit Mark's Splash supply rooms. If you haven't visited a Splash um, uh, demo room, please, I encourage you guys to go. Kitchen and bath ideas, unbelievable products, unbelievable service. Um, but Mark is on the, the panel today to talk to us about just his transition from a business owner that has been in business for 55 years, why he, uh, he and uh, members of his family chose to, to go the ESOP route. So, um, you know, just without any further ado, um, I think that, you know, the first topic that we'd like to tackle, oh, and I, I'm so sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, 
Melissa Bijak. I'm with Grossman, Yannick, and Ford. Um, I'm the partner who runs our business valuation and litigation support group. Um, our litigate or our uh, valuation group handles uh, a pretty robust uh, ESOP portfolio. Um, we work on transactions, uh, initial transactions, sometimes stage transactions of ESOPs, and then we are around to do the annual valuations that are required by the Department of Labor. So, uh, sorry about that. Um, I do want to uh, jump into the first topic, and Dan, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you just kick us off by talking about um, or dispelling those myths that exist when we hear people talking about ESOPs? Yes. Well, Melissa, you didn't need to introduce yourself because everybody knows you and, and respects you. So thank you for the introduction. Really appreciate that. Yeah, let, let's kick it off with kind of some of the common myths slash objections uh, when we start talking about ESOPs and because maybe people kind of tune out because of preconceived notions. Uh, and so just kind of rattle off a few of these here. Uh, first of all, we hear, well, boy, ESOPs are complicated. Well, I guess technically they, they can be. But with the right team in place, those technical issues are taken care of relatively smoothly and generally smoothly. Um, and you know, worthwhile techniques sometimes have some complications to it. Some state planning and tax strategies, there's some complication, you, you will have that. So I don't know if it's a myth or not a myth, um, but I think the myth is that you, the business owner has to deal with it all themselves. And that's not true. There are professionals that help you through that make the decision trees uh, that, you know, a, a lot fewer and get, get through. I, I hear ESOPs are expensive. Um, you know, well, they, they may, I guess relative to, for some business owners, it might be some of the largest checks they've written. But on the other hand, um, compared to other methods of selling a business, and when we talk about some of the tax advantages, such as potentially not paying capital gains tax and not paying income tax, income tax on profits again, it's, it does become kind of relative. Um, you know, and hey, Mark, you're always willing, you're always able to jump in here. I think Mark, you said to me one time, it wasn't expensive. It was priceless. Didn't you? I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Feel free to jump in anytime you want here. Okay. But we, we, we hear that, um, you know, if I sell more than 51% of my business, my employees are going to run the business. They're going to vote me out. And that's absolutely not true. ESOP's kind of a, um, kind of in a, uh, I don't know corner by itself, whereas you sell more than 51%, um, you don't lose control of the business. Um, it, it's, the board remains intact. The seller can remain president, CEO, chair of the board for as long as they want, pass the reins to whoever they want, family, key management, when they, when they wanna do that. Um, and then on that point, I think that you and I early on both thought that there, there's a better term than, than ESOP and really ownership should be changed to trust instead of ownership, you know, an ESOP, you know, trust plan. You know what, that brings up another really good point. We, we throw around the word ESOP. It stands for employee stock ownership plan. Um, stock ownership plan. People confuse it sometimes with stock options. It's not an employee stock option plan, which is a different animal. ESOP means something very specifically in, in the, in the, in the re Eternal Revenue Code. It's a qualified defined contribution retirement plan covered under the same section as 401ks and other qualified retirement plans. We've got discrimination rules, contribution limit rules. We have to follow all of those things, which is um, a large part why maybe you don't hear as much about ESOPs. There are those technicalities of following the Department of Labor and IRS guidelines and the tax advantages and the rules and regulations, but it's kind of like cash for, remember cash for on um, clunkers? Back when you had, you, know, you had the wrong car and if you sold it and bought the right kind of car, you got some really good tax deals. Well, ESOPs are kind of the same way. Some people call them cash for codgers. Um, if you have a business and you sell it and you reinvest things and you do the things the way the government um, suggests you do it, which is attain very attainable, uh, get some very, very good tax advantages. So the employees aren't voting you out because the business owner out because they don't technically, even though it's called a stock ownership plan, they don't technically own shares of stock. They have a beneficial interest in the trust, Brian, as you just mentioned. They have a beneficial interest in the trust that owns stock on their behalf. Mark, let me throw that to you. How can you? How's the control been in your company? There is a trustee involved. Are they breathing on your neck? Who's running your company? Um, I very seldom talk to the trustee. We really uh, 
uh, look for him advice. He's an accountant. And um, so we look to him for uh, different, um, maybe a, a, a situations that come across the company that um, we need financially. We, we look to him for some advice, but uh, generally we never hear from him unless there is a document to be signed or something of that effect. So uh, he is really a, a non-entity within, within that scope of that, Great. the people involved. Wonderful. And so in your current role is right now, Mark? I'm the president of the company. Okay. Still the president of the company. Um, I'll, I continue to do that for probably the next uh, eight to 10 years. Um, I also have three boys in the business. My wife's in the business. They, uh, I have daughter-in-laws in the business, which is dangerous. But, uh, they, they're, it is all, uh, we, we, it's a family affair uh, among 70 other em employees within the business. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Um, and two more myths or, or objections. Um, I hear a lot that ESOPs are difficult to finance. Um, ESOPs just require a normal corporate loan, maybe collateral. Um, when I look at cash flow, value of the business, kind of the normal commercial loans are available to ESOPs than um, any other uh, commercial loan in, in, in essence. So and if there's any bankers here, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But we have no problem financing ESOPs out there. In fact, because of one of the tax advantages that are so great, um, it enhances the willingness of lenders to lend to an ESOP. And then the, the last one is when we, I'm going to talk next or, or a little bit about um, the tax advantages of an ESOP, a little more specifically and, and quickly, but a little more specifically. Uh, when we talk about these, I hear, boy, it sounds too good to be true. This can't be possibly be available. And why that beep have I not heard about this? I mean, I get that every single time I talk about ESOPs to, to business owners or folks that aren't familiar with ESOPs um, because of the, the, here's the reason is the government loves ESOPs. They like ESOPs from both parties. Bernie Sanders, one of the biggest ESOP supporters in, ever. Uh, and then you have Chuck Grassley, Republican from out uh, West. And then you have um, uh, Mike Kelly here in Pennsylvania. Trump did a speech on employee ownership. Reagan did a speech on employee ownership. And in fact, at the last Congress, there was a, a bill in the Senate and the House, but the Senate bill had 34 co-sponsors and it was split 17 and 17. That adds up to 34, doesn't it, Melissa? I'm not an accountant, I think it does. <laughs> it was split right down the middle, um, Republican and Democrats. This is one of those things they really do hold hands and sing kumbaya because one, one party kind of looks at it as a, finally the, the employees, the rightful owners are getting what's theirs. The other side says, hey, we don't we we, we love employees having independent wealth because those are less people that are going to rely on the government safety net later on. And when we give tax benefits to businesses, they're going to grow, hire more people, expand product lines, um, pay more wages, and that's exactly what happens. Um, and so it's not too good too good too good to be true. The bill is going to be um, and then yes. On on that piece, remember it was the, the first thing you said is this fall is ERISA which means that at some point the government's going to get the tax dollars whenever these participants receive the cash outs. So there, it's not like they're just going to you know, not get tax revenue either. The government's still getting it. They're just delaying it. Well, when the employees cash out the shares that they were given for free, yeah, they, 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 they may Correct. tax, not in Pennsylvania, but they but will pay some tax federally um, if they qualify yeah. if they're in a tax bracket and they pay tax. Um, but when they take their money out of the ESOP, they, delay that further by rolling it into a four, uh, uh, an IRA. So it delays it Correct. for a pretty darn long time because that's one, another advantage of being a, a, a qualified plan. And for financial advisors, that's an area in which financial advisors can help their clients is dealing with that rollover out of the qualified plan into a personal IRA. Um, and also in the CARES Act too, it's two, right? Not three, two. Um, there's language in there to expand the ESOP benefit, the tax benefits. Um, it's a couple lines in there. It hasn't been taken out. They've been popping this in bills for the last couple of years. It's in there. There's a very, very good chance we're going to actually increase the tax benefits I'm going to talk about, believe it or not. And in the state of Pennsylvania, where most of us are from, um, we were very proud that we got through the state house last year, a pro-ESOP bill 
that increased the tax advantage advantages for Pennsylvania residents. Now, when COVID hit, it died, the, the bill died um, after we worked hard to get it through the finance committee and on the floor for a vote and it passed. It's being reintroduced. It's House Bill 285 in the PA House, primary sponsor, Daryl Metcalf here in Butler County. Um, I urge you to call your state representative, get, get them to support House Bill 285 and, and get this thing moving forward. Um, Pennsylvania and Arkansas are the only two states that don't mirror one of the federal tax advantages of an east -based. And so when we testified in front of the Finance Committee in, in the PA House, we said, don't be Arkansas. And they listened and they passed it through the House. So um, that, that's, that's the, the kind of some of the myths, I guess, or, or arguments against these subs. Now, briefly how it works. And we have any comments, my, my peers here? Well, Dan, just one comment before you move on to the structure. Uh, one of the uh, hurdles or perceived hurdles uh, for ESOP ownership that I hear from most advisors is that looming repurchase obligation being, uh, you know, the, the biggest issue. Um, can you speak to that, you and, and, and potentially Brian, um, just kind of giving people a basic understanding of a way that a repurchase obligation works. Yeah, Ryan, would you like to go first? Do you want me to? I actually want you to go first. Okay. I, I think okay. you should take that one first. Well, we, we, some people, that should actually, that should be on my list of objections. Or, or There is something called the repurchase liability or repurchase obligation. The government says we gave business owners a bunch of tax advantages that I'm gonna talk about. But what you have to do is when the employees have shares in this qualified retirement plan and they retire, die, become disabled or quit or get fired, um, you have to make a market for that stock. You can't just say, hey, here's some Nicholas supply stock, right, Mark? And I hope you can find somebody to buy it someday. A, Mark doesn't want the stock running around all over Western Pennsylvania, but the government says you have to provide this retirement benefit. You have to cash it out. And that's called the repurchase liability. We highly recommend that um, a, a company does a repurchase study, a liability study to, to kind of project over the next 20 years what that liability is going to be, and then start putting money away as a corporate asset on a corporate balance sheet to prepare for that eventual liability. Um, and it, it, it doesn't matter what products or whatever the financial work with the financial advisor to make sure they, they put something in, in, in place for that. And that's where Brian, that's where your expertise comes in um, on, on, on that area, I believe. Yeah, on the planning side of things, you know, one of the benefits of the ESOP, you know, when done correctly, and Mark will talk more about this, but you, you essentially become a tax-free entity. So all the money that you were paying that, you know, was going to the government, well, now you can choose where it goes to. And, you know, if, if you have a strong CFO, which most of the ESOP companies that, that we know uh, do, you know, they're going to look into the future and say, let's keep building up this stockpile so that we don't have to rely on future debt which they could, but they don't have to rely on it solely to be able to repurchase the shares of the company because they don't necessarily know when someone is going to, you know, leave the company and already have some of their shares vested that need to be repurchased. That could happen at any moment in time. Yeah, um, and, and to your point, um, Brian, with the the additional cash flow, um, you know that that really provides the, the security in terms of saving for that in the future. I mean, it's not an obligation that you're gonna see day one. Um, I would add that, um, you know, those big ESOPs that had repurchase liability issues, you know, we had one of steel company here in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, that was, a, uh, that was an issue that had its own specific facts and circumstances. One of the things that we do at the outset and, and how I got to know Dan is that we do feasibility. Uh, we're looking to see is a, a, an ESOP feasible for the particular company. If you have a situation where you have an aged workforce, um, you know, most of your employees are in excess of you know, 50, 55 years old, an ESOP may not be the right fit um, due to the amount of time that you know, once the employees are vested, they may be placing their shares back to the company. So. Um, those feasibility studies really lend themselves to making ESOP successful. Then bringing advisors like the, the you know the valuation professionals. We're talking to our uh, ESOP clients about re repurchase obligations annually. 
getting our arms around what does that look like now and then how do we save for it so just kind of that's one of the biggest hurdles that i've heard about esops in addition to the cost that i i thought you know we could um you know dispel from the outset and i think you know mark nicholas knows having gone through that feasibility exercise with dan that he was able to enter that transaction with confidence uh if i could speak a little bit about that um we, uh, we've really attacked uh, the, on two fronts. Uh, one is um, with satisfying our old shareholders. And initially we took out a, a loan through the bank and um, that was in 2019. And um, at, as a matter of fact, we've actually, uh, with the cash flow that we have, we're able to pay off the bank already, which was a five-year loan. And um, we're attacking the the loans that we have with our, our outstanding loans we have with our shareholders. So um, I'm looking for this to be satisfied within a rather a 12 year period, which is what we put out. Um, we're really looking at maybe uh, six years to seven years. We'll have this totally paid off uh, to our uh, old shareholders and uh, we'll be free and clear at that point. So then you're just building uh, equity within the company, pouring that money back in and to build your company to make it uh, so much better. So um, very, Thank you, Mark. It, it's been very good for us. Well, with that being said, let me let me briefly list the tax advantages. There's there's several, but most the, the two and a half biggest ESOP tax benefits. One's for a C corp and one's for an S corp. And that's what some of the pending federal legislations and Pennsylvania legislation is going to take care of. But as it stands now, if an owner of a C corp sells their stock to an ESOP and they reinvest the proceeds into qualifying stocks and bonds of U.S. domestic corporations, and we could have an offline conversation about that, you can indefinitely defer and potentially even eliminate the capital gains tax that's normally doing a sale. It's like a 1031 real estate exchange. 1035 life insurance exchange. The ESOP provision is 1042. That says you sell your stock, you reinvest it properly, you can elim potentially eliminate the capital gains tax that's normally due. That's the first and oldest tax benefit that may need to convert to a C, form a holding company. There's all kinds of planning techniques around that if that's a benefit the selling shareholder wants. The second big tax advantage, which is frankly the driver of pretty much 80% of all ESOPs getting put into place today. It's the advantage of a 100% ESOP owned S corporation. Because when a company is a 100% ESOP owned S corporation, the profits are no longer taxable because the tax form, the K1, doesn't go to mark anymore. It goes to the ESOP. ESOP's a tax exempt entity, <clears throat> a tax. And so Mark now, is, as the board member says, we no longer need to declare distributions because our one and only shareholder being the ESOP doesn't have to pay tax. So we're no longer declaring distributions. And so that money stays at the company. We've increased the cash flow of the company 35 to 45%. And now the company has a lot of this extra cash flow. And that's what's used to finance, to pay off the debt we incurred to buy 100% of the company. Is that what you're doing, Mark? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's how we could pay off those loans so quickly. So those are the two big tax advantages. And sometimes they can work in conjunction with each other. And if this federal and Pennsylvania laws get fixed, um, everybody can have both of those benefits, which would be absolutely tremendous. Um, and plus, there's some estate planning issues at, th at that point. It's time to do your estate plan, but we'll leave that for another presentation. Um, in typical structures, kind of what I said, uh, typical structures these days are 100% ESOP owned S corps. We get the bank financing because banks are willing to lend, usually somewhere between 40 to 50% of the value. And then the sellers often take seller notes and get, get um, installment payments over a period of years for the balance. They're their own subordinated lender and they get rewarded for that. Because sellers bear seller interest only debt and usually at a below market interest rate, they get rewarded on the back end with some kind of payment in kind. Sometimes it's a percent of the future equity value of the company up to 20, 25% of whatever the future equity value of the company is as that reward for bearing seller debt, interest only, sitting behind a bank and a below interest rate, a below market interest rate. So three components, upfront money from the bank, the seller note, installment payments, and then that second bite of the apple, which is the um, reward for bearing that seller debt. 
doesn't have to be that way. Doesn't have to be 100 percent, but it's it's the maximum efficiency for tax benefits when structured that way, and that's ultimately where most ESOP companies want to be. Um, you can stray from that, but that's the typical structure. Thanks, Dan. Um, and <clears throat> with the trusted advisors in place, handling all of those elements of the structure of an ESOP should not be a problem. Um, there are a lot of people out there that, that like to talk about the DOL not liking warrants um, and, that are associated with seller financing, but you know, the economic reality is when those uh, selling shareholders take such a subordinate position and at an interest rate that is extremely low, um, you know, warrants, for lack of a better term, are warranted. So, um, you know, we are capable of calculating, you know, values of warrants. Um, we're also capable of speaking to, you know, what's that tolerance in terms of percentage dilution, um, you know, all of the things that come along with maybe a, a, a more of a complex deal structure, um, you know, advisors that are in place are more than able to, to handle those aspects of, of the ESOP. Um, I, I think we should shift gears now. Um, you know, one of the biggest catalysts uh, and, and, you know, the, I think the, the critical uh, timing for today's panel is talking about ESOPs. ESOPs in 2021 versus 2022. Um, can we talk a little bit about that, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't think it's a secret to anyone on this call that uh, there's a high probability that there's going to be some sweeping tax changes. Uh, you know, most likely is not going to be effective in 2021. Uh, but everything that, that we're hearing and, and Melissa and everyone on this call is hearing that 2022, there's, there's going to be some type of a change. Uh, and, and it's really going to affect almost every single type of uh, transition of ownership within a privately held company. If you transition ownership internally, tax rate's going to be higher. If you uh, sell a company to a third party, the tax rate's going to be higher. Uh, if you try to, you know, just transfer the, the asset upon, um, you know, the, the patriarch or matriarch's uh, death or passing, uh, tax rates can be much, much higher. So with all of those tax rates going up and yet the ESOP, you know, not actually changing and in fact becoming a more of a benefit, you know, one of the things that we want to talk about was, you know, well, what's going to be the biggest difference between you know, 2021 and 2022? Um, you know, Melissa, you know, I'd love for you to add in some of, you know, the insights that you're seeing into not only the tax changes, but, but valuation changes that, that we are potentially seeing too. Sure. And one of the things is, as you look ahead to the tax regime um, and looking at corporate tax rates, uh, right now, corporate tax rates are 21%. And when we value um, a privately held business for ESOP purposes, um, that's going to be applying corporate level tax. Um, right now, 21% Biden administration potentially going to 28%. Uh, we have a situation right now where, um, you know, the value, other every, everything else being equal, uh, the value of a company right now uh, is going to be higher due to the extra ta uh, the uh, extra tax savings in the current tax regime. So. Um, I think that's a that's a motivation for um, doing things in, in 2021 as opposed to uh, 2022 when um, you know we would be uh, held to applying a, a higher tax rate. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because uh, what we're held to as valuation professionals and uh, advisors as a whole in operating in the ESOP space the value that needs to be ascribed to these transactions is going to be the term fair market value. Fair market value is a financial value. Um, you know, that is, that's a value based on uh, the assets that are in place, uh, a going concern situation. It's not a situation uh, where we're looking to combine our assets and, and um, people with another company. So where you go through due diligence and you're looking at uh, the, the income statement of a and resulting cash flow of a company and you go through and say, well, I have my accounting personnel already. I'm going to eliminate that expense. Um, I have uh, certain expenses that I can cover in terms of insurance. I can get better discounts. And, um, you know, that synergistic aspect of a transaction when you're selling to a third party 
um, that's not the price that we're looking for uh, when we have an ESOP transaction. Um, there is a negotiation, and I know, you know, we may have wanted to talk about this uh, down the line, Dan, but um, just to kind of tee this up, when we go through an ESOP transaction, it's actually a negotiation between the selling shareholders and their advisors, and then, um, you know, myself and the trustee of the ESOP acting as a fiduciary of the ESOP at the outset of the transaction. And there is a little bit of leeway um, in terms of fair market value. There can be a range of fair market values and that's where the negotiation comes in. However, when we get into trouble and you uh, see certain cases that the DOL brings into uh, existence now, that's in a situation where um, you know, the selling shareholder is actually getting more than fair market value um, and you know, where we see those issues. So that's that's where we're held to that fair market value. And at times like this, um, you know, 2021, when we still have a lower corporate tax rate, uh, you can see fair market value being a little bit higher than, you know, doing the transaction down the line. Dan, anything else you want to add um, in terms of 2021 tax regime? Yeah, I just want to, I just know me and my counterparts that are ESOP consultants are, Getting a, phones are frankly ringing off the hook because people, and not just ESOPs, I imagine all M&A transactions because people want to, quote, enjoy the current 20% federal capital gains tax rate, assuming any change isn't retroactive. Most are assuming January 1st of 22 is when I'll start. So a lot of folks are trying to get a, a transaction done this calendar year, eat the 20%. Um, this year, um, and then be tax free going forward. So when tax rates go up, it doesn't it doesn't uh, hurt, hurt them. So that's what we're seeing now in 22 and beyond. We take advantage of that other tax advantage, which is potentially not paying capital gains tax if you invest it properly. That 1042 we talked about. However, there's a lot of strings with that. Um, and if you switch to a C corp to get that benefit, you're stuck as a C corp for five years, paying C corp taxes for five years. So, and you have to mitigate those taxes during those five years. So people are really trying to get this transaction done in 21. Um, good, bad news is eight months isn't a ton of time to shop for a buyer, prepare, get all cleaned up, negotiate deals and close by the end of the year, you're kind of pushing it. Eight months is plenty of time for an ESOP if we start now. So for what that's worth. No, excellent points. And I think, um, you know, with the time that we, and we will handle uh, questions at the end, I can see some dialogue here on, you know, what, what's a good, what uh, good parameters for an ESOP. But um, I would like to turn things over to Dan and Mark, just to kind of lead a discussion on the, the story of Nicholas Supply. Um, you know, one that is pretty close to my heart in working with Mark and his family. And, um, you know, one of the things that we didn't talk about um, in, in teeing all of this up is that not only are there tremendous tax advantages to ESOPs and um, enjoying the additional cash flow, um, you know, one of, it, it, one of the other aspects of an ESOP that you know, we should talk about, and I know Mark is going to weave into uh, his discussion, it's having that culture, having that employee ownership culture. Um, that's a big deal. And it's also a, a situation where, you know, having that culture, that's going to breed success for the business. So I'm going to turn things over to, to Mark and Dan to kind of walk through the Nicholas Supply story. We've well, heard enough from me. Mark, tell us about you, your family, the history of the business, and why you chose an ESOP. Um, well, Nicholas Supply is basically made up of two components. Um, we have the pipe valve and fittings, the Tim Taylor uh, type uh, approach of, of business where we deal with tools and pipe valve and fittings and things of that nature. And then we have the splash showroom, which is the part that appeals to uh, all the, um, the women of this world with the, the bling and the, the, the thrills. We carry products such as Kohler fixtures, um, um, Delta faucets and Moen faucets. We carry uh, steam generators and, and saunas and things that uh, really make the bathroom a great experience. We also uh, delve into kitchen cabinetry. So we, uh, we have designers on hand. I have a number of kitchen and uh, kitchen designers which design uh, kitchens and uh, pantries and closet systems and things of that nature. 
Um, we also carry hardware um, for doorknobs and, and all those uh, things that can, uh, go with uh, either pulls or, or handles in hardware. Um, we also dwell in um, tile and stone. So we have all sorts of, of uh, artistic type tile and things of that nature. Uh, we were uh, formed by my father back in 1956. Um, he was a, a, an entrepreneur. Uh, he actually had a music degree out of IUP and, uh, and his father, my grandfather was a, uh, in the building supply business. And uh, when his, he sold his building supply business, um, uh, the builders were driving it into the ground and my uh, father thought the best thing to do is to step out on his own. And uh, he formed a plumbing supply of all things. And um, that was founded again in 1956 with two other individuals which were later um, bought out. Um, he, uh, we currently have five locations which we surround Pittsburgh and in Pittsburgh, we have uh, 70 employees. Um, the, uh, with the development in the 60s, uh, we were able to, my father was able to grow the business, uh, taking it from three individuals up to approximately five or six. And uh, in, the, in the 70s, he, he um, built a new building, which is currently um, just off of Route 8, it's the Harley Davidson building. If you ever saw that big orange and black building on Route 8, that was our building through the 70s, 80s, and then we sold it in the uh, late 90s. Um, so uh, in 19, in, in the 80s, we, we uh, uh, built or uh, started up two new locations, which are in our Bridgeville location and also Murraysville. Uh, that brought us to three locations, and in uh, uh, in the nine in 1991, we uh, built a building. We realized that the that the um, construction business was really leaving the Glenshaw area and um, the the north uh, the southern part of the North Hills, and we went out to Cranberry Township. And we, that was just a great move for us because that's where all the new construction was really happening. And uh, that's where we remain today in, um, with our um, Cranberry location. Um, seeing that uh, the turbulent 90s were very difficult for us, we had a lot of um, overhead, a lot of um, debt and um, maybe a few bad management decisions. We were um, very close <laughs> within a few days of actually going bankrupt. And uh, those were just, uh, <laughs> those were hair raising days to say the least. I was uh, out with the branches and my brother was running the, the rest of the business. Um, not in 2001, it took a turn for the better. Things really turned for us and um, we became much more profitable uh, in 2008, we actually bought a, uh, a particular um, a bankrupt company in Pittsburgh, and um, that became our fifth branch. Um, we had a situation in 2002 where a, um, a, a, a national, actually an international distributor wanted to purchase us, and they uh, invited us over to uh, their location and to, to take a look at their, um, their facilities and, and, and try to appeal to us to, for that purchase, which we turned them down. That was in 2002, uh, 2005, uh, because we, didn't, we weren't purchased by them. They came and planted themselves right across the street from us in Cranberry and stated that they wanted to put us out of business within a couple years. Um, that has failed miserably and I, I, as I say, I always welcome competition because competition only makes you better. And uh, we were able to uh, be better. We've improved ourselves in many capacities um, in the service end of things. And, and uh, that has just helped us tremendously. Um, in 2013, um, uh, my brother who became president after my father's retirement in 1985, 
he retired from the business and I became president of Nicholas Supply. Uh, we, at that time, we had 45 employees, um, which was a part of that was my wife, my three sons. I have uh, three boys in the business, which I stated earlier, and I have two daughter-in-laws in the business. So it is really a family affair, but, and, and I look at uh, the business, not only as my intimate family, but I look at all the employees as my extended family. Uh, we have developed a um, great rapport. You're working with these people every day. So I felt a great uh, obligation to them to keep them as part of the business and um, getting offers on a probably a monthly basis from, uh, from different entities throughout the country and um, throughout the region. And uh, they, they look at our showrooms as very desirable, uh, part of which, um, you know, bring those into their, their um, repertoire. And uh, so, but uh, I just didn't feel that the right thing was to sell the business. I, I felt that our whole administrative portion of the business would go away. Those people would lose their jobs. And I just felt that that wasn't what I wanted to do with the business. So um, in 2019, uh, my financial planner uh, inter introduced my wife and I to Dan. And um, we had, a, after a two hour conversation, I, I was totally really unfamiliar with um, ESOPs, but talking to our financial planner, he just thought that the best, uh, after telling him my upset with the taxation, the upset with the transition, what, what was I gonna do with this business? Um, he, he really said that Dan would be the guy to talk to, Mr. Aesop of Pittsburgh. And uh, so- uh, so There's plenty of other professionals out there too, Mark. I don't want this to be a Dan commercial. Oh, okay. Well, anyhow, Dan did a great job of explaining to us the, the, um, the aspects of the Aesop. And really I came away from that uh, saying, this is too good to be true. And usually when it's too good to be true, it is too good to be true. But as I've learned over the last couple of years, uh, it is too good to be true. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it has transformed our business in a profound way. Just the way I look at uh, managing that business and the financial aspect of it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so um, when I was considering the, uh, the ESOP option, there were several things that I had to contemplate. And number one is my outside of the business, I had no um, desire, uh, my family, uh, this is my old family, the family that had been with it, my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law, my uh, had no desire to be in the business anymore. And so that presented a dilemma, especially on shareholder day when we'd get all together yearly and talk about the business. So that was always a stress point uh, in our, our, our conversa conversation. Um, my brother, uh, it was not really feasible for us to buy out my uh, old family um, because my brother had an inflated value of the worth of the business. And um, so we had to get back to reality of what the, the real worth was. Uh, in the ins uh, the ESOP evaluation gave a fair market value to the company, and my brother and sister were satisfied with that value. And I was on both sides of the equation. I'm I'm an old owner and I'm a new owner, so I wanted it to be a very fair, um, um, a fair equitable um, solution for for all parties in, uh, in involved in the, in this transaction. Um, so uh, the, the, the second option was that the family legacy would remain intact. And I always promised my dad uh, that I would keep the company intact and, and keep that Nicholas name as long as I possibly could. And, and that meant a lot to me. He was so integral in the, the um, beginning of this company. And he just, the customers loved my dad and my, the employees loved my dad and he loved all of them. Uh, the company uh, name to remain the same, honoring my father's legacy, my family members will continue 
on into the fourth generation. Um, I can see a number of my grandkids are already, already talking about being in the family business. So um, that is a rewarding thing to me also. Uh, number three option is the controlling aspect of the company. Um, because of the ESOP option, the board of directors are made up of myself, my three sons, one outside director and our, our ESOP trustee. Thus, the, uh, the management in the company has not changed at all. Um, in, in the outset of that, the, uh, the employees, when they were trying to wrap their head around the ESOP, thought that maybe they could be in on the board uh, and they uh, dressed in different attire and said, hey, when am I going to be on the board? And I had to tell them that uh, that had nothing to, the ESOP had nothing to do with the everyday uh, uh, makeup of the company, it's going to remain the same. And the, uh, the board is who I deem is, I'm the one that made the, the deal and I'm, and I'm going to keep it the way it is. So, but our employees as a whole, um, because they, we, we freely share information as far as the, uh, the profitability of the company, we have a, a, a quarterly profit sharing plan that we do, that we distribute cash out to all of our employees that, um, that are rewarded for their the profitability of their particular branch. Um, so we do a lot of things that are very open to all of our employees because they do such a great job. Thank you, hey Mark. Yes. Because um, we have some questions to get to, but I think you've hit all of the high points. I mean, it was ESOP was a viable option such that it was transformational, both you know, company culture-wise, financial impact, 2019 transaction, the loan is paid off and it's only 2021. Um, you know, that, that's incredible. And, and, and two, you know, what we talked about, I think as a panel is, you know, ESOPs now are a way to attract and maintain employees. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, with that, unless, I mean, you, if you have any closing uh, comments, Mark, um, I think we'll move on to, um, you know, there are a number of questions and uh, things that we'd like to get to. Uh, just two quick points. Um, employee retention. Um, it's a great um, um, vehicle for employee retention. Our, our employees, I was able to um, accelerate their, um, their, um, uh, gosh, their uh, vested interest in the company. So if you if the comp the employee was um, five years with for every five years that the the employee was with the company we gave them a year of vested interest which up to six years is fully vested uh, that was one thing and the other thing is um, recruiting new employees and just talking to people about um, uh, their ability to be a part of the company and and be not just another number. Uh, with some of these corporate giants that I face every day. So those two components are very important in the aspect of the, the employee um, interaction with the company. Excellent. Uh, Brian, is, are we able to move to questions now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the, the questions I think that uh, most participants uh, have and you know, I'll direct this first to you, Dan, because this is really what at the heart of what you do at, at Business Transition Advisors. Um, what is the kind of the the what sets up the stage for a uh, feasible ESOP in terms of what revenue do you need to have, number of employees? Can you speak to that, please? Yes. Um, you know, every firm has maybe different parameters, but I think the industry standard is a business worth. Uh, it starts working at a business. Uh, at about 10 million of value, uh, which might mean 2 million of EBITDA at a five, an average of a five multiple, but it could be lower than that. Um, and certainly much, much higher. ESOPs can be done from a $3 million company to $500 million company. But generally when you get over the 10 million mark, it starts working a value to make it worth its while because there's expense to it, 20, 20 to 25 or more employees, million of payroll or more. Um, uh, and, and an owner wishing to take some or all chips off the table. Did you comment on, I didn't hear you, Dan. Did you comment on number of employees? 20 to 25 okay. or more. Excellent. It's just guidelines. There's always flexibility. 
Excellent. And what about, uh, I see a question out there in terms of, uh, you know, what is the estimated cost of feasibility? Yeah, well, th there's different fees along the way. Feasibility site, I, boy, it's hard to, I, I don't, that's hard to answer. I mean, twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars, depending on the size, scope, and everything that's you're, you're analyzing. Okay. But if we talk a little bit the lower broader. But if we talk a little bit broader, Dan, on just the cost of an ESOP compared to a cost of another type of transaction, um, you know, and, and I look at this as if you were going to hire an, an investment banker to go and, and run an auction process for your company to, to sell to a third party, um, you know, the fees are, are significantly different. And, and most of the time, the ESOP is going to come in much, much cheaper uh, than, than a traditional investment bank is. I mean, you, you think that an investment bank is going to sell a company for $50 million. Well, they're going to be somewhere between one and a half and 3% of that overall value that the company was sold for. Um, the ESOP is not going to cost anywhere near that that percentage. And plus the other uh, professionals. Plus the other professionals, not counting the, you know, the accountants, the attorneys that are going to be necessary for, for that transaction as well. And that's about the range for an ESOP, including all of the professionals. And, and yeah. two, I, I think to, to kind of button that up in terms of fees, I mean, Obviously, we're going to have a big outlay of fees on the part of the company at the at the outset, you know, the transaction and getting everything papered and everything in order. Um, after that, you know, if you choose to have the independent trustee stay on, as Mark did, for that independent advisor, that fiduciary, um, there's a fee associated with that on an ongoing basis. And then the other one is the valuation. However. Um, you know, just as everything else, when we first do the valuation, the fees are going to be, you know, higher than ongoing. Ongoing is typically half or even a, at times a third of what the, the um, valuation uh, fees are at the outset. So, um, you know, that I think dispels another, you know, uh, part of the cost associated, you know, with ESOP stand that you talked about. Not only is it um, you know, for the transaction purposes, it's probably a, a less costly um, all, uh, uh, endeavor than, um, you know, a third party transaction. And also ongoing fees um, are really pretty manageable unless, you know, there's, um, you know, for us, we get involved a little bit more with some of our very successful ESOPs that look to purchase additional companies because that cash flow generation, once you got you know, you, your, your debt paid off and you have the, the repurchase obligation already in tow, you know, starting to save for that, companies look to buy other companies, um, ESOP companies, because of the cash flow that's available. Uh, only one other comment that I'm going to let uh, Brian speak to that I think was a great comment by Matt. I think it was Matt Bradbury. Um, when you talk about, you know, selecting an ESOP, um, is there an ability down the line, Brian, to sell your ESOP company? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, but the people who are going to receive the benefit from the second sale are going to be the employees. So think of it, you think of it just like any other company. The business is owned by someone. In this case, the ESOP trust owns the entire company or, or a large portion of it. If the, the members or the management team decide that it makes sense to be acquired by another company, well, then whatever that value is, if it's if it's 10 million, 20, 100 million dollars, that all goes into and is paid out pro rata across um, the vested interest. And, and really it accelerates the vesting in each of the owners of the uh, of the of the ESOP trust proportionally. So, yes, there's absolutely uh, that potential. Melissa. Can I, can I add one uh, additional comment here time-wise? To put all of this together, we've talked about all these components. So now you might be wondering, well, then how does this actually work? And quite frankly, I don't need some big graphics. I don't need boxes and arrows. It's quite, it, people make it more complicated than it needs to be. So putting all this together, this is effectively what's happening. The ESOP borrows money from a bank. The ESOP uses that money to buy the stock from the selling shareholders. The company uses all the tax savings because they're not paying tax anymore to contribute to its retirement plan every year, which would be deductible. 
And then the ESOP, the retirement plan, uses that money to pay off the debt. So the ESOP borrows money, buys the shares from the selling shareholder, uses the tax savings to contribute to the ESOP, and the ESOP uses that contribution to pay off the debt. Shares are handed to the employees over a period of 20 to 30 years as an employee benefit. And then when the employees leave, the company must make a market for that stock and buy their stock back with, a, with some kind of sinking fund or investment account they're preparing for on their balance sheet. So that kind of summarizes and wraps everything up of kind of how it actually works and how the different pieces fit together. We just got one last very good question, I think, that I want to pose to uh, Melissa, Dan, and Mark. So the question is from, uh, from Brian uh, Barrent, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, can an ESOP trust hold a different class of stock other, you know, other than shareholders, you know, for instance, prefer preferred versus common? It has to hold the highest class of stock. Correct. So diving deeper into that, because I know that there's, there's more to the, the structuring. Say there's a management team that is integral to the business and you're selling to an ESOP. Is there a way to uh, discriminate within reason to give them a higher benefit than say, you know, uh, just, a, just a, a normal, you know, employee in the business? Melissa? I'll let you take that one, Dan. Okay, okay. Um, the, the, it's, the answer is a yes and a no. Um, you can't discriminate because it's a retirement plan. With that being said, allocations are generally handed out according to compensation relative to total payroll. So those that earn more are getting more ESOP shares. We can give credit for prior service, which tend to be the higher paid people, for uh, credit for prior service for vesting purposes. Um, so that's one way, but almost, almost all ESOPs as well, not almost all, many, many ESOPs that we do, you actually do some kind of management incentive, um, some stock appreciation rights or phantom stock in conjunction with um, the, um, the ESOP shares. So when you do that, you have employees plus management and the seller with ESOP shares. You have the, the managers and key executives with some kind of stock incentive, stars or phantom stock, and you have the seller with that future equity stake to reward them for bearing seller debt. You have every single person in this company aligned to do well and drive value of this company. It's, and that's why the government likes it because over time, over an eight year period, the government makes more money from the economic activity of the higher wages and the expansion of a company than they gave up by allowing the company to not pay income tax. That's why they're not trying to take away this loophole. So Dan, and I think that might be a perfect place to end. Yeah, yeah. That, thank you guys. That was really great. Mark, thanks for sharing the journey of Nicholas Supply. I mean, I think everybody, most people on this call, we, we are fascinated by the entrepreneur and the founder story and history. So thanks for sharing that with us. And uh, Dan and Melissa, uh, appreciate your knowledge and input and Brian as always uh, thanks for everything that you do and um, with that we're going to wrap it up and hopefully we have uh, the same or better level of, of attendance the next time thanks everybody for spending your your time with us take a care. great day thank you yeah. thanks everyone have a great rest of the day you too